Sermons at Emmanuel is a wonderful resource to hear God's Word. Today, Rev. Edwin Tor speaks to us about what it means to be restored by God, and most of all, that God wants to restore us. We just need to listen to His voice. Restoration is the act or the process of returning something to its original condition or to a state similar to its original condition. In other words, it means bringing back something that is old, that is worn out, or broken back to its former state, where it would even be better than the original state. That is, to make it look new, to make it uh, better than it was, and that is the biblical way. And, 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 and this understanding of the biblical uh, definition is well captured in the life of, of Job or in the story of Job. When we read in chapter 42, verse 12, it says, So the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He blessed the latter part more than the first. God restored to Job twice his wealth and his health. He lived for 70 years before calamity struck. And then he lived for 140 years after that. Is that twice? So that is why God is saying he will repay you twice the lost time. In fact, we are told that he saw his descendants to the fourth generation. That is, he lived to see his great, great grandchildren. Is that not amazing? If God will help you to live, up to the fourth generation, surely. It was a life well lived. And so God compensated Job what he had lost. In Joel chapter 2, verse 25 to 26, it says, I'll repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you you will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. So in this passage also, God is promising that he will repay us the years that the enemy has stolen, that the enemy has destroyed. God is saying the misery that you went through, the deprivation of life, that you are supposed to get, I will repay. And God is promising us also that whatever the enemy has stolen or destroyed, he is ready to repay, he is ready to compensate twice as much. What is it that you want God to compensate? Uh, the, the devil wants us to be defeated and not have a life and have it to the full. But Christ is saying, I have come so that you can have in its fullness. So that you can have life in its fullness. I want to also to, to share three things that hinder us from experiencing full restoration from God. The first one is neglecting and taking for granted the things of God. We have neglected and drifted away from observing the biblical or the basic things that used to be loud and vibrant in our lives. There are things that used to be loud in your life. There are those things that used to be vibrant in your life. For instance, family prayers, studying God's word, which were once your lifeline, they have become even optional to you. Lukewarm Christians. And, 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 and lukewarmness was talked about in reference to Laodicean church. And Christ gives a description of this church. When he says, I know you are dead, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. To be a lukewarm Christian, you are neither here nor there. You are seen as a Christian and sometimes not seen to be a Christian. You become a lukewarm person. And so, Christ described this church as wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So let us not live a lukewarm life 
as Christians. But instead, let us be, make a deliberate effort to pay attention to those eternal things that are more important to us. This is what the writer of Hebrews encourages us to pay attention to the things of God. When he writes in Hebrews 2, 1 to 3, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have had so that we do not drift away. Things that we have had, things that we have been preached to, so that we may not drift away from the ways of God. And in this letter of Hebrews, he's saying, how can we neglect such a great salvation that has been given to us? Because this salvation is a precious gift to us, which Christ gave us on the cross. And we cannot afford to neglect or to assume. We cannot neglect such a great gift that has been given to us. There is a, uh, an image that is shown where the father, the mother, the children, including even the, the pet dog. No, they are in their phones, even the dog in the home. You know, using the, using the, the iPad. Yeah? And everybody is just busy in their own corner. So what I'm saying is there are other things that have really taken uh, more attention in our lives. Social media is becoming a problem to us. Sports, yeah? for us men, we like sports, isn't it? As an all, I'm Manchester Damo. <laughs> Entertainment, you know, we have given these things more attention, more than spiritual things. We have neglected the spiritual things and then give attention to these other things that we feel they are important to us. And yet, these things will lead us to blindness and nakedness. You know, spirituality cannot be intellectual. It is experiential. It is an experience in your own, it's a personal experience with Jesus Christ in your own life. We cannot take it to be an intellectual engagement. We should be able to experience the things of God. Paul told Timothy that not to allow himself to become careless and neglect the calling, the wonderful opportunity that had been given to him. You can read that in 1 Timothy 4, 14 to 16. That do not allow yourself yeah, to be taken away with other things. But that, the calling, the wonderful opportunity that you have been given, you should take it to be so serious. This is a wonderful opportunity that God has given us to know him, to experience him in our own life, and to be restored to himself. So the first thing that can hinder us from full restoration is neglecting, assuming yeah, the things of God. The other thing that hinders us from experiencing full restoration is broken relationship with other brethren. I know that strong relationship usually takes time to develop, but it can be damaged so quickly by careless talk. God's intention is for Christians to love each other and to live in harmony. That is why a significant portion of the New Testament is devoted to teaching how we can get along with one another in fellowship. That Jesus Christ is saying, love one another. In fact, what is the greatest commandment the disciples asked? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself. To love another person as you love yourself. The, the book of James brings us how broken relationship can occur among the Christians. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have. So you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. And you know, when James talks about killing here, he's not literally killing. You can even kill the person with the words that you speak about that person. 
You know, you can kill. You can bring that person down by the way you speak. And so the root cause of all this is covetousness and bitterness. The bitterness that we have. Very often, gossip spreads lies. And, and by gossiping, you are perpetuating lies about another person. The cure, the cure of gossip is given by Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to the, their needs, that it may be benefit those who listen. Paul is saying, whatever comes out of your mouth should build another. Talk something that will build another person, but not to destroy another person. The other thing that uh, causes this is self-willed, and self-willed also has other things. My way, you become self-centered. Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or feigned conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should not look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. The Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The way you love yourself, naturally, the Bible is saying, love also others the way you love yourself. As Christians, we have been restored, who have been restored, we should be other-centered, you know, other people-centered, not self-centered. The Lord wants to bring restoration and healing to your life. He can touch the deepest hearts and restore the deepest broken relationship if you seek him in your heart, if you genuinely seek him. And I want to ask, do you know of anyone you have a broken relationship? Is there anyone that you think you are not relating very well? Can I give a suggestion? How about calling that person tomorrow or even today? I just say hello. I'm just praying for you. <laughs> yeah? or, or it is difficult to pray. You know, sometimes somebody who has really hurt you so painfully. Is it possible to call and say, you know, I'm praying for you? Is it possible? Remember <clears throat> the incident of those who crucified Jesus Christ on the cross. What did Jesus Christ say? Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Yeah? And yet, you know, these are people who killed him, yeah? who hurt him the most. And I want to say, if Jesus Christ eh, forgave them on the cross, while he was on the cross, and you are just leading a very normal life, why can't you just do it? Eh? And yet you are very normal. And I want to say the remedy for a broken relationship is forgiveness. Forgiveness. And so when Peter asked Jesus Christ, how many times should I forgive my brother? What was the answer? Is it 70? It is 70 times? Seven. Limitless. Hmm? You know, you can say, I have forgiven you. The first time. The second time, I forgive you. The third time, I forgive you. Ah, this one. <laughs> I, I don't think I can, I can do more. Hmm? Is it possible to give, forgive a person more than 10 times? More than 20 times? Why can't we exercise that? And forgive them for what they have done to us. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make peace with everybody. Make peace with all men. Once we are restored, we are not supposed to keep the past memories. Not to talk or even think about them. We should not even talk or think about them. Before we were saved, every one of us had a past life, isn't it? We all had a past life. We committed many sins by doing things that were not pleasing to God. But let us praise the Lord because when we genuinely repent and re be restored to Christ, our past is washed away and all our sins are forgiven and forgotten by God. You know, when God forgives, He forgives and He forgets. But many of us, we still harbor the past things in our lives. 
But in Isaiah 43, 18 to 19, it says, Forget the former things and not to dwell on the past. Why? Because he is doing a new thing in your life. God is doing a new thing in your life. Don't dwell in the past. The past has gone. Things that have gone, have gone. It has been established and we know that our wives and our ladies, they are very good in keeping records of our wrongs. True or false? Men, true or false? They keep a record of what their spouses have done, what their husbands have done. You know, you are talking about things that your husband did 10 years ago. And you know, so to some men, you get to Elisha, eh? to Lisa Howe. But our ladies here, they can remind you of so many things. And they can count for you. I even know that some of you, you have a record. Eh? Now, I want to bleed with you. By the mercies of God. <laughs> that if you have a record of what you, your husband has done, please delete. Look there, delete. <laughs> please delete. <laughs> Delete completely and let it go. No matter how painful those mistakes that your husband did. You know, the enemy wants to use our past to fill us with regrets, with doubts, and hopelessness. Because we, he knows that this kind of guilt will, be, will make us to be paralyzed. This guilt will make us to be paralyzed. Jesus said, anyone who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. If you are looking back to the things that you did before, he is saying, then you are not fit to the kingdom of God. God keeps doing new things in our lives. And if we look back, we will surely miss out on what he wants us for today. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I forget the past and I focus myself to the things that are ahead. That is in Philippians 3.13. Because when God gives us full restoration. He does not remind us of the past. You will begin now and going forward. Because the past has gone. Things that we did in the past have gone. I want to assure you that God wants you to live a life in its fullness. God wants to give you full life. He wants to restore you so that you can have the fullness of life. I'm doing a new thing in your life now. Let us begin now in 2019 and go forward because God is a God of restoration. He's willing to restore you.